But I want to dive into a brand new series, uh, as Christina mentioned, called The Diary of a Dreamer. And it got me thinking because dreams are powerful. Now, I was thinking this week about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream, uh, that his dream had transformed the soul of a nation, changed the world. Uh, different side of the dream spectrum, but Walt Disney had a dream. Uh, in fact, years ago, before there was Disneyland, he had a dream that a park that both parents and kids would both enjoy. What he forgot was where parents would also spend way too much money. Come on, somebody. <sighs> But that dream has impacted millions. If you have kids, you've probably been there or thought about going there. Or maybe many of you have been there. Uh, and then Steve Jobs, you know, years ago had this dream of what would it be like if we combined the iPod with a cell phone. And so birthed the smartphone, which has changed all of our lives. Uh, some for the better, maybe some for not so much. But regardless, is these dreams, and just a snippet, have changed our lives to some degree. They've changed the world. That dreams have the potential to change our lives and change the world. And we see in the scripture a clear precedent to have God giving people dreams and visions. And this series is called The Diary of a Dream. If you're new to Catalyst, we teach in series and and in this series, we're, we're calling it the Diary of a Dreamer because we're going to be looking at the life of Joseph in the book of Genesis. I particularly love to do character studies like Joseph or Daniel or Esther or Ruth because there's so much that we can glean from the lives of these men and women who were ordinary men and women, but God did extraordinary things. And may I say this to you this morning? You are an ordinary person, but God wants to do extraordinary things in and through your life. Can I get an Amen. Some of you just got offended by me because I said you're ordinary, but hey, it's okay. There's only one extraordinary, and his name is Jesus. Uh, but we, we see in these lives, we can glean principles of faith and life from these men and women. In Joseph's life, it's called the diary of a dreamer because his brothers called him a dreamer. They said, look, here comes the dreamer. But what we see is Joseph had this dream. That when it came to fulfillment, it ended up transforming a nation. It transformed his family. In fact, it's a dream we're still talking about today. So it's transformed many, many lives. And here's what I want you to take hold of today. Is that we serve a God who is a dream giver. And dreams are for everyone. We see in the scriptures, Joseph, or God gives a dream to Joseph at 17. Maybe some of you are saying, hey, that's for the young, younger people. God gave a dream to Abraham at 75. Cover the spectrum. So you are not too young, you are not too old to dream dreams again. And God has a dream for you. God has a vision for you. We're going to talk in this series. I'm going to encourage you to come for all four weeks. Because each, each week we're going to build on each other because we're going to talk about how Joseph today is, is the origin of the conception of a dream. But how the dream unfolds. And, and how he goes through different seasons. In fact, 22 years from the conception at 17 to the full true fulfillment of his dream. 22 years. So it takes some time. But talk about how do, we, how do we navigate, how do we steward the dreams and visions that God puts in our hearts. And in fact, for sake of just clarity and definition, I want to define between a desire and a dream because... There is a difference, and not that one is a desire is bad, it's just different. So a desire, by its definition, it's kind of a working definition, is, is about what we want to possess or something that serves ourselves. These aren't bad things. You may want a nice vacation this summer. And dad, mom, you deserve it. Come on, somebody. Uh, you, you deserve it, regardless of who you are. Right? You know, we, we, we might desire a good vacation. Come on. Dad, on Father's Day, you might desire some peace and quiet in the house. Come on. I tried to convince my kids that Father's Day was also no fight, your siblings' day. Come on, somebody. Uh, I broke up three fights this morning. I said, come on, it's Father's Day, kids. You can't fight today. You can't fight today. It didn't work. But you may desire a nice car. You may desire a bigger home. I mean, those aren't bad things, but they're different. They're different. So it's not bad to have desires. But a God dream, that's what I'm going to call it today, is a God dream, a dream from God, is a larger vision 
about who we will become, so who God's forming us to be, and the difference we will make in other people's lives. Here's one of the biggest differentiators between a dream from God versus a desire. Write this down. Is a dream from God is ultimately about making a difference in other people's lives. Do you want to know what's on the heart of God? It's people. It's about loving people, serving people. So a dream from God can be to have a profession, have a, have a medical, uh, a job in the medical field where you're bringing healing to people through your work. It can be to launch a nonprofit to serve those experiencing homelessness in the D.C. area. It can be to have a larger home so you can host more people. It can be to raise a godly family. It can be to make a certain amount of money so that you can be extravagantly generous. Again, the core of a God dream is ultimately, so you're, the, the, the why behind it is I want to honor God and make a difference in the lives of the people around me. So what we're going to talk today is how do we discern between a God dream and maybe a dream that's maybe just we came up with or a God dream in the cold pizza we had last night. And then how do we receive a dream from God? If God is a dream giver, how do we receive a dream or a vision from God? And for the sake of our conversation, I'm going to interchange the word dream and vision. Biblically speaking, uh, if you're like reading scriptures, a dream always occurred when someone was asleep and a vision occurred while they were awake. So you'll see those terms used differently, but for the sake of our conversation, I'm going to interchange those today. But I want to talk today about how do we receive that dream, discern if it's a dream from God, and ultimately live out that dream. But first, let's pray. Father, we thank you today. Your word is truly a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. As we open it up today, God, we know that you are speaking to us. Your word is holy and it's inspired. So we we say right now, God, we know you're speaking, so we as your servants are listening. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, Genesis 37, if you have your Bibles, we're going to read 11 scriptures to kick us off today. Verse 1 says, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Jacob, a young man of 17, was tending, sorry, Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks of his brothers, with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Just a context, Jacob and Israel, they're one of the same here. Because he had been born to him in an old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. If you're familiar with the story of Joseph, that's the, the coat of many colors right there, that ornate robe. When his brothers saw their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. A little side note, parents, don't play favorites. Come on, somebody. It never goes well in scriptures. Uh, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of the dream and what he had said. And they punched him in the throat. I just added that one there, you know, I'm just thinking brotherly, you know. Come on, not too wise. Tell a bunch of guys who hate you. You're like, hey, guess what? Guess what? I got great news. I'm going to reign over you. Come on, somebody. Like, I probably shouldn't have done that, Joseph. But he was 17. Then he had another dream. He said, listen, listen, I got even better news, guys. Come here, come here. I had another dream. This time the sun, the moon, the 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, and his father kept this matter in mind. So we see this conception of a dream. In fact, I've entitled today's conversation or message, It Was All a Dream. A little throwback for some of you. A little notorious B.I.G. It was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine. Salt and pepper and heavy D up in the limousine. Anybody else? You feel me? I'm going to stop right there because there are moments that get a little bit inappropriate. I'm a man of God, so I can't go there. But 
we look at Joseph's dream in this moment, and we're going to see and glean some principles of how we can receive a dream from God and beginning to steward a dream from God. Uh, So with that said, here's point one if you're taking notes. In fact, let me say this first, though. I want to give you my sermon in a sentence to kind of let you know where we're going. And that's this, is that God dreams lead us to find true joy in him. And we're going to kind of conclude with this thought at the very end today. So here's point one, is that God dreams are formed in the presence of God. God dreams are formed in the presence of God. So Joseph had two different dreams that were very similar. And to give you context culturally, it was believed that if God said something twice to you, or you had two dreams that were similar of nature, it was God communicating this will certainly happen. This is why the brothers, the Bible says, were jealous of him. And his father was pondering it because he's like, okay, this will really happen. Because if, if, if God gave you two dreams that spoke the same message, it was saying, this is going to happen. And I want you to catch this. In fact, we see this throughout scripture, that our God is a dream giver. He gives us vision for our life. Let me give you scriptural examples. Genesis 15, 1. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. He goes on to tell Abram and reminds him that I am calling you to be a father of many nations. Now, when he gave Abram that initial vision, Abram was the ripe young age of 75. And his wife had been barren his whole life. Write this down. God dreams will often supersede your current circumstances. It will almost seem contradictory. Like if you're Abram, you're like, listen, like, God, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of I'm tying some things up. I'm living off my 401K. I'm kind of I'm done raising kids. In fact, my wife, we've been trying for years, but we can't have them. In fact, oftentimes you know it's a God dream because without his supernatural grace, it could not happen. Without his power, there's no way this would come to be. May I submit this to you? If the dream you have, you can accomplish all by yourself without God, I would question if it is God. Because God loves to lead us into a place with dreams and visions to where we're saying, God, if you don't come through, this will not fully happen. He wants to give you dreams that supersede your own self. Because his thoughts, his ways are above our ways. They require his supernatural grace. In the book of Acts 16.9, here's New Testament. Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia standing and begging to him, come to Macedonia to help us. That Paul was heading somewhere else. All throughout the scripture, God dreams oftentimes provide direction for the future. And it was scripturally believed when you had a dream of this nature, you had a vision. It was a message from God that he was sending it to you. In fact, there are 116 dreams from God recorded alone in the Old Testament. There are 36 different times God gives someone a vision in the Bible. There are five people, there are five different dreams in the Gospels that people had of the birth of Jesus before he was born. It was believed that like, in fact, it was unfavorable if you didn't have a vision from God or a dream from God in the scriptures. It's all throughout. Abram had a vision to be a father of many nations. Joseph, the father of Jesus, had a dream at night where an angel said, it is true, Mary is impregnated by the Holy Spirit. Peter had a dream. He was on a roof. God gave him a picture. And what he said was, hey, Peter, Christians are not bound by kosher laws. In other words, have all the bacon you want, Peter. And everyone said, amen. Thank you, Lord. But here was the more important thing God was doing. It wasn't about bacon, although that is amazing. It was actually about this, that Jews were being racially discriminatory towards Gentiles. And Peter and God was, was end up reconciling the races. Peter and Cornelius, two leaders in the Jewish and the Gentile race, reconciled from this moment. That God, well, Remember, God's dream for your life is much bigger than you. It's much bigger than bacon. He was reconciling two races in this moment. Paul had two different dreams. One about going to Macedonia. One was to keep preaching in Corinth all throughout the scriptures. And here's what you'll find. Here's what you'll find. Dreams are for everyone. 
They're not for the spiritually elite. God gave dreams to a tent maker, to a fisherman, to a business person, to a government worker. He gave visions and dreams to everyone. It's for everyone. In fact, 2 Kings, we see a dream, a vision that God gives the prophet Elisha. In the Old Testament, predominantly God spoke through his prophets. Now the Holy Spirit, we'll see, is for all of us that we all can get dreams and visions. These three kings were facing a famine and drought in the land. So they call Elisha the prophet. Elisha in verse 15 says, bring me a musician. He said, bring me an electric guitar. Come on, somebody. Then it happened when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him. As he worshipped, the spirit of God came into the place. And he said, thus says the Lord, make the valley full of ditches. You shall not see wind nor rain, yet the valley will be filled with water so that your cattle and your animals may drink. That this vision from God comes in the presence of God. That God gives vision, God gives direction. Again, God was delivering this for a group of people through the prophet. Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching. And Peter recites a prophecy from Joel chapter 2. The prophet Joel, a minor prophet in the scriptures. And here's what he says. In the last days which that was then, that is now, the last days. God says, I will pour out my spirit on some people. Are you still with me? All people. Your sons and daughters will dream dreams, or prophesy rather. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Here's what Peter reminds us, that the spirit of God does not discriminate. The spirit pours out upon all people. Men, women, hey, parents, children. Do you know the Holy Spirit can give children a vision? Can give cho- The Bible says it here. They will prophesy. The Spirit of God is for all people, not just pastors. It's for the business person, the teacher, the nurse, the doctor, the au pair, the, the mom, the dad, the child, the government official. The spirit of God is for everybody. Can I get an amen? He wants you to dream dreams. He wants you to have vision in your life. Let me get real practical for you. I'm going to give you kind of three, three ways you can cultivate and receive a dream from God. Three kind of environments, so to speak, that God can give you a fresh vision or dream for your life. And then we'll kind of give you three questions of how to discern, is it God or my own selfish ambition? Is it God or my parents? Is it God or that cold pizza I had last night? Here's number one. Is that God can give you a fresh dream in worship. Can I tell you, when you're in an environment like this in the presence of God, God is always with us, but his presence manifests, meaning it's tangible in certain environments. That's why Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my name, I am in their midst. He's not saying I'm not with you when you're alone. He's just saying there's sometimes it's different. That's why you might sense the spirit of God different in an environment like this than when you're by yourself. Because the presence of God manifests. The spirit is, you you sense it. And I, I tell you to take notes. Bring a notepad. Pull out your phone. Take notes. Here's why. Not to just record all of the countless wonderful things I say. Although there are many. Just kidding. But listen, in all honesty, more importantly, for you to record what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. There's been so many times I've been in a service, someone said, Pastor, when you said this, I said, that's a really good word, but I didn't say it. (laughs) The Holy Spirit said that to you. In fact, 13 years ago, we were in a worship service, Christine and I, much like this. We had been praying for months about whether or not to move to the D.C. area. In a worship service, during the, the worship, the music portion, Christina got this in her, in, her, in her mind, this vision of her with our friends who had a church up here in this area, ministering and serving. That she got a vision, she got a direction of something we've been praying for. Be sensitive. Listen, be sensitive to what you feel, to what you sense, to what you hear in your spirit when you're in an environment like this. The Holy Spirit will speak. He also speaks through scripture. Let me, and we're going to get to this. God does not contradict himself. The primary revelation and vision we have for our life as followers of Jesus is in his word. That's why it's important that we, we are grounded and we stay in the word because God does not contradict himself. But here's what happens. There's, there's two Greek words for the word word. There's logos, 
which is a written word, which is the Bible. Then there's rhema. It means revealed word. Here's what it means. You can hear the logos, which I'm preaching to you today, and the Holy Spirit will speak a rhema, a revelation to you. When you read the Bible and it seems like the Bible jumps off the page, that's a rhema. The Holy Spirit is speaking something specifically to, to you. And they work hand in hand. Thirteen years ago, I was reading Genesis chapter 12, where the Bible says, God says to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to go to the land that I will show you. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit, so strong in my heart, in my mind, said, Jeremy, I want you and Christina to move to the Washington, D.C. area, and I'll show you the rest. You know what I didn't see 13 years ago that I now see today? I didn't see Catalyst Church. A little side note, write this down. God will not reveal to you the entire vision and dream from now to your death. Because he'll only show you the next step oftentimes because he wants you to trust in him and not the dream. He wants you to, to walk with him and not just take the plan and say, okay, I'm good, Jesus. He wants you to walk with him, to trust him. Because we'll get to it. That's the best part. It's him. But he has a dream for you. He has something he wants to speak to you. So scripture. And then lastly, he's prayer. And not just talking to God, but listening to God. Okay, can I just, man, I highly encourage you. If you do nothing else, do this this week or make plans for this. Take 15 minutes. Take 30 minutes. Take an hour. If you have, I'd love to do this specifically on vacation too. But take a little bit of time this week and take out a journal. Uh, and if you're not a journaler, just get a journal anyway, okay? <laughs> I'm not, I don't, I, I am not naturally someone who journals, but I have found profound benefit of recording what God speaks to me, what God shows me. Uh, so take a, take a journal and then just, just ask God, God, what do you see in my future? And just quiet yourself before the Lord prayerfully and record what you sense God is saying to you. If you're going on vacation this, this summer, I love to take a vacation. I'll take like a morning of a vacation, several hours, and say, God, what do you see in my future? What do you see in my kids' future? Hey, Dad, one of the best gifts you can give your family is get a vision for your family. Like be envisioned about your children. That's why in the midst of, here's why, here's why, here's why. It, it'll empower you to pray into and speak into their future, not just in the present. Same for your life. You can pray into Speak into your future of what God has for you. Now, how do you know if a dream is from God? Let me give you three questions. These are important because how, how do you know if this is really from God? Number one, is my dream affirmed by Scripture? Is my dream affirmed by Scripture? Again, God will never contradict himself. If you said, Pastor, God spoke to me. I'm supposed to launch an illegal drug business. I don't know if you heard God. He wants you to get high on the Holy Ghost, okay? Like, if, he, if he's, and listen, not just like, this is the what, not just that, but if your dream from God causes you to contradict your biblical value. Like, if your dream, if your dream is causing you to pull further away from God, I would question if it is God. Like, well, I'm so busy writing this book, raising these kids, launching this business, Working on my education that I don't have time like I once did to read my Bible, to pray, to be in church. That I would question, is this really God or, or am I doing it a little bit, am I a little bit off when it comes to my pursuit of this dream? Is it affirmed by scripture? Number two, will my dream bring honor to God? So the first question is about the what. The second question is about the Why? You can do the right thing with the wrong motivation. You can actually launch a business and, and make millions of dollars and honor God. I've seen many men and women do this. You can also have a job and make far less money, but do it to make money and the intentions are wrong. The Bible says that greed is a trap. You, you, can, you can launch a nonprofit, but if you are honest with yourself, your, your heart desire is you just want to be successful. That's your sole focus. And the Bible says wherever there's selfish ambition, there lives every evil thing. You can do the right thing for the wrong reason. This is where you got to be honest with yourself. What, what's truly my heart motivation? Am I really wanting to honor God with this thing? 
I believe, you know, as long as it's not contradicting God's word, you can raise a family and honor God. You can work in medicine, honor God. You can launch a business and honor God. You can do most things and honor God through the process. It deals with the why of your heart. And then lastly is, will my dreams serve people? God's all about people. Joseph's dreams served people. Abraham's dreams served people. Paul's dreams served people. Is this going to help people? Is this going to love people, serve people? God's dreams are formed in the presence of God. Here's number two. Point two. Is that God dreams require a dream team. God dreams require a dream team. Now, I hand it to Joseph because he didn't sit on the dream. Now, did he tell the right people? I don't think he did, okay? You probably shouldn't tell the people who hate you about your deepest personal dreams. A little side note. A little side note, too. Not everyone will be for you. Just some people, out of their own insecurity, are intimidated by a God dream. So be careful who you share things with because not everyone will be for you. But you do need to take action. Let me say this. Dreams come from God. Write this down. But dreams come about through our obedience to God. All across the world, there are many God dreams buried in cemeteries. And part of my passion today is I don't want that for any of you. Like, I want the dreams that God has for you for the sake of the people whose lives will be changed by what God's put inside of you. For the sake of your own soul. I want you to fulfill what God originally intended for you. But listen, you don't just get a dream from God and then just kick back and God's like, watch me work. No, there's often a part he plays and a part that you play all throughout Scripture. Right? Right? And we see it in the life of Joseph. We see it in the life of others. In fact, the 2 Kings 3, it's Elisha. What's the first thing? God says, I will bring, you won't see wind, you won't see rain, but I'm going to fill this valley with water. But what's the first thing he tells Elisha? Dig some ditches. Now, don't you think he's God? He He can form water without wind nor rain. I'd be like, God, while you're at it, can you just go ahead and dig those ditches? Come on, somebody. But I want you to write this down. It's our obedience that shows that we trust and believe him. It's when we do what God's told us to do that actually tells him that we believe what he says, that we believe what he's shown us. Listen, you can have a dream all day for a six-pack, but come on, somebody. You need to watch those carbohydrates. You need to do some crunches. You can have a dream to go into medicine, but you need a degree. You need proper training. Like, there's things that you have to do. But listen, it's it's, it's not just this. You get a dream from God, and you go make it happen. It's you walk with him in the process. Because... Because God wants to do things in and through your life beyond your natural abilities and cognitive ability. He wants to do things in your life that you couldn't do on your best day. He he wants to do things. What he does, we'll see this this, through the life of Joseph, Joseph could have never done. What he did through Abraham, no 75-year-old man could have done. What he does through Paul, through Peter, no person could ever do it. I was reminded of a couple years ago in the church. They were told by doctors they were physically unable to have children. And they respected the physicians. But they kept praying and, and asking God like for his will, his direction for their life. And at one point, she, his, the wife, got a, got a dream of her holding a baby. And she felt the Lord spoke to her that they were to prepare by building out a nursery. And they initially thought to themselves, people are going to think we are fools. Like, we've been told we can't have a baby, and we're going to turn our office into a nursery? So they're like, bye-bye baby, buying a crib, buying a changing table, 
painting the walls. And it wasn't like, boom, she was instantly pregnant. No. It took some time. But you know what? Months later, she became pregnant. Now, I'm not saying if you build a nursery, you'll have a baby. <laughs> but I want you to hear this. She heard from God. And she trusted God enough. The Bible says God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Sometimes to see a God dream come about, you have to do something foolish. You have to do something saying, God, I trust you more than I trust anyone else, including myself. And God will do what we could never do. So you need to take a step of faith. I want you to ask God, God, what's the next step I'm supposed to take? Maybe for some of you. In fact, I was reminded this week, six years ago, over six years ago now, God began to speak to Christina and I about this church. And one of the first things I did like no one else knew but her and I initially. So I was like, okay, you know, I was just sensing the Lord. And I really felt like the Lord had put on my heart to go ahead and buy the domain name. Couldn't do much. But I went on like, I think it's like cheapdomain.com. Come on, somebody. I bought every domain available for Catalyst Church. <sighs> Why? I took a step of faith. God, I'm going to believe you. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to buy this domain in faith, believing that what you spoke to us about this church is going to come to pass. What is that for you? Maybe for some of you, you know there's a book in you or several books. You need to put yourself in front of that computer and begin typing away. For some of you, that business in your heart, you need to go to the state office of Maryland in Baltimore and file that LLC. Maybe for you, it's like God spoke to you about having a baby. You need to begin to prepare, save financially. Come on, kids cost a lot of money. Come on, somebody. Like, what is it for you God's calling you to say? Uh, Maybe for you, you feel called to give away a million dollars in your life. You need to begin to save and budget so that you can have the money in order to be able to take that step. Habakkuk 2.2, God told Habakkuk this. Write the revelation or the vision and, and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. He says, write the vision down. Little side note, it's important to write down what God begins to show you. So about a month ago, I actually went back to a journal from 2017, and I was reading through like a vision that God was giving Christine and I for this church. And some things have come to pass. And it will encourage your faith when you see the faithfulness of God. But he writes it down. But listen, the scripture says so that a herald or somebody else can read it and run with it. Here's how you know it's a God dream. It's far bigger than you. You're going to need other people. What we see in the scriptures is that God dreams require dream teams. Paul had Barnabas. Peter had the disciples. Abraham had Sarah and others. Joseph, we'll see, a people in his life that came alongside of him. You know, it reminded me in 1988, the uh, U.S. men's basketball, they kind of, were in this a rough season because they, they ended up, they were supposed to be the clear favorites for the gold. But they ended up getting the bronze medal and lost to the Soviets in the Olympics. They were highly discouraged. So the U.S. basketball kind of association, they kind of had this vision, and we have to get back on top. So what did they do? They formed what is known affectionately, historically, as the dream team. Some of you are old enough, like myself, that you remember this team. Michael Jordan, the greatest of all time. Come on, where are my J's today? Come on, somebody. Charles Barkley, Carl Malone, John Stockton, Larry Bird. The first team they played in the Olympics, they beat by 79 points. They demolished. The U.S. was like, we're the best. <laughs> Just in case y'all forgot that year. And what do they do? They recognize we have this dream to win gold again, but we need the proper team. And listen, in the Bible, in our lives, I want you to hear this because it's contradictory to our Western culture. Our Western culture loves the idea of the solopreneur, the lone ranger, the independence. But can I tell you, 
That's nowhere in the scriptures. We are a part of an interdependent kingdom called the kingdom of God. Do you want to know the currency of the kingdom? It's relationship. All throughout the, the Bible we see it. It's relationships that God works. Here's how I like to call it. Divine flow relationships. It's when you meet somebody. When you get in relationship with other especially followers of Jesus filled with the spirit. Have you ever met somebody and you thought to yourself, there's something deeper to this relationship, but I don't fully understand it. Or, or maybe you ever had a relationship where it just like felt super easy. Like the conversation and like, I, I had a true story this past week. While I was prepping for this message, I had a divine flow lunch. A pastor who I met for the first time, been pastoring in D.C. for 13 years, and we just like clicked. It was like we became instantaneous friends. We've been texting each other, like sharing ideas and all, all kinds. It's been, it's been great. Like it was like I know like not every person I have lunch with is like that. But I know there's something here. Like there's something here with this. I don't know. But there's something. I'm going to keep investing. Divine flow of relationships. You can build relationships and be aware. You never know. Can I tell you my years of pastoring? That I've seen people go into business with someone who was in their community group. I've seen people meet their best friends. I've seen people meet their spouse while serving together. Come on, some of y'all are like, I'm going to next steps today. Come on, somebody. Holla at your boy. Hey, if you're going to mingle anywhere, mingle in the house of God. Mingle away, okay? But you need a team of people. You need people around you. Let me tell you three things that a divine flow friendship will provide for you. And listen, you need a team or people around you. But listen, you need to be on other people's teams. One of the best things you can do for your dream is to build somebody else's. Serve somebody else's. Like, get behind somebody else. And on a side note, is we have to guard against the spirit of the, older, of the brothers, the older brothers. Because, listen, if we have a false perception, if I believe the God of the universe gave you that dream, I should not be threatened by it. Because he's the God of the universe. But if I have a natural, narrow mindset, it threatens me and I become jealous of you. As the people of God, we are called to cheer each other on, not be jealous of each other. That if you win, we all win. Like, like we are for each other. The kingdom of God is large. Can I get an amen? Let me give you three things to do for people in your life. And three things we need to fulfill the dreams God's given us. Is that you need someone to encourage you. Paul had all three of these. Acts chapter 9, Barnabas. Uh, people were skeptical of Paul because he had just killed Christians. I mean, for good reason. He's like, hey, hey, here's Paul. Yeah, last week he killed your cousin, but uh, he's bringing the message today. Everyone welcome Paul. Everyone's like, no, nah, we ain't welcome Paul. We're going to cut Paul, right? <laughs> but Barnabas is like, no, like God is with him. You need a Barnabas. You need a Barnabas when other people don't believe in you, they do. May God, God's with us. I, I, they believe in that dream. I, mean, I, I have a friend I met with this week. They're a Barnabas in my life. They encourage me. They, you, he, they, he believes in, my, in the dream God's given me, and, it, and it's, it's refreshing. You need someone to believe in you, and you need to believe in somebody else when they don't believe it themselves to encourage them. Here's number two is resource, resource. Paul had the Philippian church. Philippians chapter 4, Paul said that your sacrificial generosity has enabled this ministry for the gospel to be preached throughout the world. Sometimes someone might financially resource you. They might get behind you. I remember years ago, I was in a, a, a Christian business leaders group. And there was one guy who was launching a renewable energy business. And then one guy, he worked with investors. And the guy who worked with investors knew of someone looking for a company to invest in renewable energy. It was like bada bing, bada boom. It was beautiful. Like two people loved God. They didn't come to that group for that, but God knew what was happening. Have someone who can, the, the, the resource can also be knowledge. Just sharing knowledge, sharing relationships. And then lastly, not to sound cliche, but prayer. 
Acts chapter 9, Ananias came and prayed for Paul. Ananias' prayer for Paul opened Paul's eyes. Can I tell you, I thought of a, of a man, dear friend. I love him so much. He's never been to Catalyst. He lives out of state. But before there ever was Catalyst, he prayed for Catalyst. He was one of the handful of people that prayed this church into existence. You need people who will pray for your dream. I felt convicted by the Holy Spirit this week to pray for my friends' dreams more. Man, pray for the people in your life's dream. Man, I believe in you. I'm praying for that book. I'm praying for that family you see in your future. I'm praying for what God's put inside of you. E prayer. Here's my third and final point. So God dreams are formed in the presence of God. God dreams require a dream team. Here's the third one. That is that God dreams draw us closer to God. End of the chapter. Joseph goes out to his brothers. And they said, look, here comes the dreamer. Let's kill him. Verse 26, Judah says to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. Hey, guys, let's not kill him. Let's just sell him into slavery. <laughs> Great brothers. Um, when the Midianite merchants came by, the brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern. That's like a deep well. They sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. So Joseph gets his dream. He's fired up, right? I mean, he's, he's, he's tweeting out. He's like, man, God gave me this amazing dream. I can't wait to see it come to pass. The next day, hashtag, I'm sold in slavery. <laughs> Have you ever experienced this? Have you ever got a word from God, a dream from God, a vision from God? And not only did you not take a step forward, but it felt like you took a step backwards. That was Joseph. Like, I can't imagine what's going through his mind. Like, God, you gave me this dream. And now I'm enslaved in Egypt, sold by my own brothers for 20 shekels, which was far less than what the average Hebrew slave was being sold for at that time. That Joseph is, is, is man, what's happening, God? And we're going to see at the end of Joseph's life, God redeems. How many of you know that God can deem whatever is broken in our life and use it for good? That whatever the enemy meant for evil, God can work for good. But the path to your dream, this is so important, the path to your dream may not look like what you're expecting. It may take longer than you're expecting. It may be harder than you're expecting. But if it's from God, it will ultimately be better than you're expecting. It may not look like it, but we're going to get to why. So what do we do in that process? Well, what Proverbs tells us in verse, chapter 3, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all of you do, and he will show you the path to take. We don't trust in the dream. We trust in the dream giver. We don't, we don't depend on the plan. We depend on the one who gave us the plan. We trust in God. In Genesis 15, it's interesting in verse 1. I read it earlier. Before God reminds Abraham of the the dream, to be the father of many nations. What does he tell him? He kind of reminds him of something. Because he knows, hey, Abraham, it's going to be a while. <laughs> and he says, don't be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. Here he reminds Abraham, 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 please listen to this. He's, this is for us today. He said, your reward is not the birth of your son. It's me. That your fulfillment will not come from the dream coming to pass. It's found in me. That peace will not come from this promise being fulfilled. Your peace will come from me. 
Like, don't forget in the process of your dream that true, lasting joy, perfect peace, lasting fulfillment comes from the dream giver, not from the dream. That's the key, church. That's the game changer. I was reminded this week with being Father's Day of my own dad. And he passed when I was 16 years old, 24 years ago. I had a great dad. One of our things that we, we did was we went to uh, baseball games. Grew up north of Baltimore, so went to Baltimore Orioles games. And uh, Camden Yards. In 1993, the All-Star game, 30 years ago, came to Camden Yards. And we went to the All-Star Home Run Derby. And some of you who you were old enough to remember, it was like Ken Griffey Jr., Frank Thomas, Juan Gonzalez, all these great players. That was the time Ken Griffey Jr. hit the warehouse in Baltimore. It's the first time, hit this bomb. It was amazing. Watching like my favorite players as a child, like all in one space. So cool. 30 years passed now since that. But can I tell you what, what has stuck with me? What was more impactful was not seeing Ken Griffey or Frank Thomas. As I was with my dad. I remember my dad. I remember his, his scent. I remember his smile. I remember his voice. It was him. Like, forget everything else. The key, like what made the baseball game special was him. It wasn't the game. Listen. At 40 years old, I've already had some dreams come to pass. God's been gracious. And I don't say this like it's not flattery, it's truth. If you knew my life, you would know for real how true this is. My wife, Christina, and my three kids is a miracle from God for for me. It is a dream come true. This church, I remember when Christina and I were dreaming with God about this church about a church that's passionate for God, diverse culturally and generationally, making a difference here in the D.C. area and beyond. And can I tell you, it's beautiful to see this church. But you know what I found? That as amazing as my wife and three kids are, they're not the key to my lasting joy. As incredible as this church is, this doesn't give me perfect peace. He is my key to lasting joy. He's the one who gives me perfect peace. He's the one who gives me fulfillment. And if we buy into the lie that we'll be fulfilled once we get that job, once I have that family, once I have that home, once I get that degree, once I have that job, then we are buying into a lie and we will live a life without lasting joy. We'll live a life without perfect peace and we will never be fulfilled because what God reminded Abram and God's reminding us today, true joy, true peace, true fulfillment comes from the dream giver, not the dream. He is our great reward. And we don't have to wait for the dream to come to fulfillment. It can happen in the midst of a cistern. It can happen if you're sold into slavery because he is our great reward. Here's the power of dreams. And I want you to live them out. Not just for your sake but for all the people whose lives will be impacted by yours. But here's the power of God dreams is that they lead us to him and they lead us to find true joy in him. Can you pray with me, church? Bow your heads.